I'm Mike King and I'm a retired criminal investigator and profiler. Welcome to Profiling Evil Insights and this segment on evidence. Thirty years ago, I investigated a cult of about 120 people in northern Utah that were sexually abusing children. It was known as the Zion Society, and it ultimately ended up with the conviction of 12 adults, including the self-proclaimed leader of the group who died in prison. It was a fascinating case, and I plan on doing a podcast on it later in the year, and I hope we'll be able to get together then and talk more about it. But I'm mentioning it today because it was an incredibly complex case filled with different kinds of evidence. I found that the forms of evidence can sometimes be confusing for people, so I thought I'd spend a moment and talk about the forms of evidence. I've broken it down into five different areas to try to make it a little easier to understand. Those five forms of evidence are physical evidence, circumstantial evidence, eyewitness accounts, confessions, and then behavior as the fifth and newest form of evidence. Presenting criminal cases that are supported by multiple forms of evidence is always the preferred method. Now, there are certainly isolated cases where a single form of evidence was used to convict someone, but it's really uh, the anomaly. The strongest cases include two or more in order to be convincing. So as we start, uh, let's, let's kind of keep that in mind. And I want to start with physical evidence. Most of us, when we think of physical evidence, we think about a fingerprint. In reality, any material or object can be physical evidence. Uh, hair, tissue, body fluids, uh, bone, all of these fit the definition. An example uh, might be something large like an automobile that's used in the commission of a crime. Or it could be something microscopic like uh, DNA evidence. Regardless, experts agree that physical evidence is the preferred form of evidence even over an eyewitness account. In the Zion Society case that I mentioned, most of the physical evidence was collected during the search warrant. But we had additional evidence that was collected by forensic medical personnel. And then, of course, we had eyewitness accounts later that we were able to tie it all together with, making it an incredibly convincing case. The next form of evidence is circumstantial evidence, and it can be a little bit difficult to wrap our minds around. Circumstantial evidence allows us to imagine what happened without experiencing or witnessing what happened. This speculation on our part helps us to connect the, the situation to the conclusion. Uh, here, here's an example that might help. Let's say tonight you take your dog out for a walk and as you're walking in the dark past a local convenience store, you see a man walking inside and he's pulling a ski mask down over his face. Now, it's 90 degrees at night in the middle of the summer. This is completely out of character. And as you stand there watching, you, you watch an interchange going on between the man and someone at the counter. And then suddenly the man turns and runs from the convenience store and jumps into an awaiting vehicle that speeds away. As you sit there trying to process what just happened, you see police cars starting to arrive on the scene and you realize that a robberies occurred. Now, most of you probably realized that long before the police car showed up, but you didn't have to see that to theorize that A plus B in this case equals C. Let's talk about eyewitness for a moment. Investigators love to have eyewitnesses, but they also recognize that there comes challenge with a, an eyewitness account. Eyewitnesses can be influenced by many different kinds of factors, including things like personal biases, age or maturity, or, or stress in our lives. Some eyewitnesses might remember an extremely violent account with great detail while another witness is so traumatized by the event that they can't remember anything about what they saw. When I think about eyewitness accounts, I go back to a, a moment in my police academy experience. It was an incredibly warm afternoon and we had just finished lunch and we were sitting listening to a lecture on evidence. 
<laughs> Everybody was having a really hard time uh, keeping awake. All of a sudden, the door swung open and a, a suspect entered into the building and shot at the instructor several times, turned and fled. In those seconds, everyone was down below their desk or, or shocked and just sitting there. But as we were trying to figure out whether to pursue the suspect or check on the in, uh, instructor, the instructor in this Academy Award winning moment jumped to his feet and he said, wait, 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 I'm okay. It was just an exercise. Sit down. Well, we took our seats and he pulled out his notepad and he said, I want you to tell me what the suspect in this shooting looked like. Now, keep in mind, this was a room of people who had been trained to observe in moments of duress. The answers were really interesting. On one end of the room, someone yelled out, he, he was tall. And another one on the other side of the room said, no, he was short. Well, the instructor was writing feverishly as the answers poured in. And, and it got really kind of interesting. Not only was he tall and he was short, but he was heavy. He was thin. Uh, some people said he had blonde hair and others said his hair was black. This experience taught me that our life experiences, our personal biases, uh, stress can all influence the way that we remember certain kinds of things. And investigators need to take that into consideration as they listen to an eyewitness account. Now, as we think about confessions and who doesn't love a confession, we need to understand that the people when they confess are admitting or acknowledging the facts that would convict them of the crime and in most cases send them to jail or prison. Now, again, while we love a good confession, it is incumbent upon police officers to have a better understanding of what's motivating the confession. Try to understand, is it really that they are so guilt-ridden that they're trying to clear their conscience? or maybe it's something else. Perhaps they're trying to protect someone, or it may be that they just frankly are mentally ill. There are documented cases where people have confessed to crimes that they did not commit. This is really an interesting uh, dilemma. Now, there is a group of uh, criminal justice professionals who have used DNA evidence to clear people of wrongly, uh, that have been wrongly uh, convicted of serious crimes. In a study that they did, they discovered that there also is either a perceived or a real intimidation factor that led to some of those confessions. There may have been devious interrogation techniques or the person may just have been uh, fearful at the time. It, it's really important that we understand and we're conducting quality interviews and when we get confessions that we really are understanding what motivates the confessions. Now these forms of evidence that we've discussed so far have been simplified and I recognize that. In fact there may be some experts who would uh, challenge me and think that we should be presenting some exhaustive list of all the individual types of evidence. I, I respect their opinions, but putting it into these five categories has really worked well for me over my career. The fifth and final one that I want to cover, though, is the newest form of evidence, and, and we call it behavioral evidence. Behavior, whether appropriate or inappropriate, is involuntary. It's dependable and consistent, and it provides us a glimpse into the offender's thoughts, their feelings, and, and their emotions. Understanding behavioral evidence is not just some form of voodoo witchcraft. It is a systematic process of applying principles, disciplines, experiences, and education. And this relatively new art form is used to add clarity to difficult cases. It's helping law enforcement officers and officers of the court with evidence that they collect and view in court to make wise decisions. I hope that you found this Profiling Evil Insights segment to be of value. If you did, would you please like it and share? And if you get a moment, go to our website at www.profilingevil.com. You can register there for upcoming uh, podcasts or for more of the Insights segments. 
You can also find a transcript of this segment when you stop in. And if you have a question, you can leave it there and we'll try to answer it in one of the upcoming broadcasts. Well, as we come to a close, I hope that you'll remember that every community has a cadre of professionals who are standing by to offer help. If you ever feel victimized or you know someone who's being victimized, get to safety immediately and help them get to safety. Once you're there, contact your local law enforcement agency, your doctor or your mental health provider for help. And until the next time we get together, thanks and please be safe.